Oke, okay, selamat datang kembali di sesi interview eksklusifnya Board Game ID di Spiel Essen 2019. Bersama kami saat ini ada Phil Harding, one of the best game designer in the world. And uh, sebagian dari kalian mungkin pernah dengar gamenya, ada Susigo dan ada berbagai game lainnya. Dan uh, kita senang banget ada Phil hari ini dan kita akan mulai ngobrol bareng dia. So Phil, it's nice to have you today. Thank you. It's great uh, to be here. It's just amazing that I mean to have you today and uh, we would like to, I mean, let's have this small discussion and uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, we really enjoy some of your game and uh, I think that was a wonderful game and I read from some uh, places that you have this own uh, game design philosophy, like the, well, I mean, you said that about accessibility, intuitive and interactive. And yeah. I think that's really interesting point of view in the game design. Could you please explore and elaborate us a bit more about those design principles? Yeah. Um, so when I first started game design, yeah. most of the people I was playing with were very new to games. Mm. And I was new to modern games as well. So... May I know, sorry, may I know what, uh, when is that? Like, This was about 2006. 2007. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So quite a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I was getting into German designs uh, and new board games, uh, and so was everyone around me. Uh, and I guess I just realized that um, that making games uh, that were easy to learn mm. and easy to play well your first time mm. was really important for people getting excited about a game. Mm -mm. Um, if I tried to do something too complicated mm. or too long or, or too punishing, mm. I found it harder to introduce people to what I was doing and mm. to, to these new games. So I just kind of naturally leaned towards mm. lighter, faster, simpler games. Mm. Um, and so some of my very first self-published games mm. were very simple. Uh, mm. Card games and simple board games. Mm. And um, I, I guess I realized that bringing people into the hobby and exposing them to new board games is really important uh, part of what a designer does. Mm. And as I saw people enjoy my games, especially people of all ages, mm. um, I realized that that's kind of what I wanted to do. I wanted mm. to make games that were accessible for people to play, um, mm. whether they were young or old, mm. if they had different backgrounds, if they'd never played a game before, mm. uh, that they could come together around one of my games. So that mm. became kind of one of my game design goals, yeah. Okay. But then, how how you really start everything? I say, what what is like bring you to think like that, or even like to start design a game? What what triggered you to do this? Well, when I got into uh, modern games, so Settlers of Catan, Carcassonne, mm -hmm. and Lost Cities mm -hmm. were like three of my early games mm -hmm. that I, I loved. Um, I instantly started thinking about making my own. Mm -hmm. But this was you know a long time before Kickstarter, a long time before. There were many, many mm. small publishers like we have today. Mm. And so I didn't really know how to do it. Mm. So I just started self-publishing. Mm. So my first game was called Archaeology. Mm. And I made it myself. Mm. So I've, I cut out the boxes mm. and taped them together. Mm. I had all the cards printed mm. on business cards. <laughs> and then I just assembled them together myself. And then I just went to a small convention, uh -huh. which was just a few hundred people. Uh -huh. And I just sold it. And I also sold it online. I only made 150 copies, I think. Mm. And um, that's how I started. Mm. And that game taught me a lot about game design and how what I did good, but what I also did, didn't do very well. Mm. And then I moved on to my next game, and I just kind of moved from game to game self-publishing like that. So yeah, and, um, got, like learning by yourself and yeah. like, by making the games. Eh? That's right. And every time you put a game out into the world, even if it's only 100 copies, mm even if it's just to a few people online or whatever, mm. you get a lot of feedback. Mm. You know, you get people uh, telling you what they liked mm. and what could be better. Mm. And so every time you do that, you learn mm. as a game designer and mm. that's how you grow. So I think the fact that I just kind of dived in mm. was set me up really well for later mm. because by the time uh, I was working with bigger publishers mm. and was coming over to Essen and doing all that, I'd already made a lot of mistakes and learnt a lot mm by trying to self-publish and trying to go on my own. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's how I started. Just There was no other way, so I just did it myself. And then slowly um, I got to meet other publishers and mm. they picked up some of my designs and uh. it kind of grew mm. from there, yeah. But when you do that, it means that some of your idea also like get some criticism, right? Mm. As some people, I mean, 
we know that we cannot make everybody happy with our design. How you how you overcome that? How you how you take those kind of criticism? Yeah. Well, so the very archaeology, the first game I put out, um, someone online. Uh, in America, bought a copy, mm. and they wrote a review online, mm. and it was it, they liked some things, but they were very critical of mm. some other things. And um, when I read it, it really hurt because I thought, <laughs> oh, I put so much work into this. <laughs> How can you say? But it also hurt because I knew he was right. Uh, okay, so I knew <laughs> <laughs> I knew the thing he was criticizing in the game right. was a fair criticism. Uh, okay, and that it could have been better. Mm. So what I did was, I made a new edition of the game, mm -hmm. and I improved the rules, and I changed a few things, and I kind of thought, well, let's try and make it better. Mm. And so I guess that kind of became my philosophy that to be incredibly self-critical. <laughs> and it's hard, because it hurts to hear criticism, especially from yourself, <laughs> uh, but to really try to make the game the best it can be. And sometimes that means listening to criticism, sometimes mm. that means taking out mm. an aspect of the game that you love but mm. isn't working. Sometimes it means putting a whole game aside mm. Mm. and saying it's not working mm. and trying something new. Mm. Um, and it's a hard part of game design. Mm. Um, every creative pursuit has this. You have to like self-critique and listen to criticism. But in game design it's particularly hard because you put so much work into a game yeah. and then someone can play it once and go, oh, I didn't like that. And it hurts, yeah. Yeah, because sometimes, <laughs> yeah. Like, but this is amazing how you handle everything. I mean, uh, even you, you said that, I mean, it's part of how you're getting better. Right? Mm. Okay, but then let's continue a little bit. Right, but why you decide to, to design this? I mean, because may I just say that family game. I yeah. Mean, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier that you, see, you lean to, so you want to, I mean, it, it has some access to a wide range of people, but I mean, yep. we can just mention this is a light family game. Even yep. Why you design you, you I think, explore this? I mean, I think it's because... So, I like some heavier games as yes. well. So, when I got into gaming, I also really liked um, Tigris and Euphrates, Puerto Rico, games yes. like that as well, right? I yeah. And I still do. Yeah. Um, but, like, the percentage of people who play those is much smaller yeah. compared to everyone who's a family or knows a child. Like yeah. that is a huge, Market, huge yeah, amount of people. And I think part of me went, I'd like to spread gaming widely. Mm. And while part of me would love to work on more niche hobby games sometimes, mm. and I probably will do that mm. as my career goes on, I hope, maybe as well. But mm. the sheer like excitement of being able to reach many, many people, mm. that is very exciting to me. Mm. So. Sushi Go mm. has now sold hundreds and thousands of copies all over the world. And that to me is so amazing that that many people have played a game I made and enjoyed it. And for some of them, that will be the first you know, modern game they've played. And that's really exciting to me. And I think part of it came from those early days um, selling my own games at small conventions. Mm. If your game is accessible to kids and families, mm. everyone will stop at your booth and have you know and play, because you know it's accessible to more people. You mm. know, you, uh, so I think that just excited me early on, mm. and the vision of trying to kind of create a modern day classic or mm. create a game that is played and enters the culture, like mm. a game like Monopoly or Uno that everyone knows, mm. that was really exciting to me. So that's part of why I went that way. I think. Wow. Yeah. 